but also from all those projects of Art and Negri or uh, uh, Badiou Zizek who believe that you know, we can still, for, for them, you know, in, in a sense, but clearly for, uh, for Badiou and, and, and Zizek, uh, liberal democracy is something that needs to be eradicated. They are absolutely against their institution. There's no attempt at all to try to transform them. So uh, I, I, I think that uh, uh, today we are still facing the, the, the way how to conceive of, of, of radical politics. And I, I'm really convinced that the strategy of war of position or hegemonic intervention uh, uh, that we put forward in uh, a hegemony socialist strategy is very relevant. Uh, it's, the terrain is, is more difficult, uh, conditions are not uh, uh, you know, very good, but I think the strategy is still the, the, the one that uh, is the most fruitful in order to think of a radicalization of democracy. Thank you. We have a few minutes for we have a few minutes for some questions, uh, and I will be the person with the microphone. So, if, okay, I think you probably. Thank you, and good morning, everybody, for like an amazing uh, event. I teach, I teach at the Gallatin School here at NYU. Um, I'm also part of a generation that comes politically, you know, during the late 1980s, first Gulf War, like early 1990s. So hegemony and socialist strategy um, was, was one of those books that you had to read and struggle and, and make sense of what the argument is and so on and so forth. Um, I want to make reference to the preface of the second edition, when, you know, which is a point that was raised earlier, where there's a regret that, you know, when, um, and if I recall, the, the preface is something like, you know, when we were trying to rearticulate social democracy, we never meant for this to become a version about how to make capitalism more user-friendly, which is a theme that, that has been um, addressed already. But my question is about the way in which hegemony and socially strategy is actually implicated in this sort of user-friendliness of, of the way the left, specifically in the US, um, operates today. So, f so for example, in a framework where to think about revolution with big R, you know, is 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 some kind of leftover of a like bygone Marxist era, um, and where political actors are specifically, you know, particularities of this of this broader process. Would it be fair to say that, in a way, what we see today with this triumph of neoliberalism? and what I call the timidity of the left is a case of the chicken coming home to roost. And, 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 and to, to pose a question less polemically, um, would you say that this user-friendly version of social democracy is a logical conclusion, not the only one, but it's certainly one of the logical conclusions of the framework that you guys uh, pose in the book? So thank you. Thank you. Understand what you, uh, uh, with this user friendly. I mean, I, uh, of course, you, you are already taking a stand, uh, uh, t saying that hegemonic uh, socialist strategy is a, a, a user friendly uh, notion. Well, we I don't think it was uh, at all the case. Uh, it might uh, uh, have been uh, interpreted by that by some people. And in fact, I I I do agree. I think this Nancy who, who make the, the, this point uh, uh, that there have been some interpretation, and some people have read our book in ways that really must have been uh, extremely shocking for us. Uh, 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 but you know, the problem is that what can you do? You, you write a book, 
and, and you it's li like you know throwing a bottle in in in, in the, the the sea and you know th then what happened there are always misunderstanding there are always people who can't read it or, or, or um or, or find it um in fact it was quite curious because some people didn't like it at all for the wrong reason because in fact they, they were uh, when we discussed with them we realized that you know, they read it in a way which was not really what we meant and and when we had a discussion we will really we re realized that we agreed more other people liked it a lot for the wrong reason also because then when we realized why they like it we said oh my god i mean this is horrible this is not at all what we wanted to say you know so uh, 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 but i don't think there is anything we could can do about that and and th this user friendly model i mean uh, I, I i don't really see i mean it certainly was not at all my, my, uh, our but one thing is to to say that uh, um, liberal democracy is not an enemy uh, uh, it, uh, let, let's put it like, like that. Basically, what if we take it that the uh, what I call the ethical political principle of liberal plural democracy are liberty and equality for all. Well, I don't think one can find more radical uh, 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 ideals than that. The problem with our societies is that they are not putting those uh, 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 ideals into question. And of course, for that reason, many people have said, okay, well, this, those are a sham. You know, we need to destroy those societies in order to uh, uh, build real uh, 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 equality and liberty for all. Our strategy was to say, no, there is room within uh, for some kind of imminent critique. Let's try to for our societies uh, to be uh, really, uh, to put those ideas into practice. And so we thought that there was room within, and of course it will imply uh, reformulating many different things. I mean, not something that you've got liberal democratic, and we then did. I mean, the, the, uh, um, there was a, a, a strategy, I, I think Wittgenstein is very uh, useful at that level, when he, he tell us, oh, you know, for instance, uh, um, you, to follow a rule is not something that you, you follow in only one way. There are always different ways in which you can follow a, a rule. And so we, what we were taught was that you needed new form of use for a series of uh, uh, ideas that were central. Transformation of institutions, that's what we call the radicalization of the project. But our idea was that it does not uh, uh, require the moment of total rupture bomb of revolution. If you call that user-friendly, I mean, uh, I, I honestly don't think it's, it's user-friendly at all. Uh. Yeah, I'd like to uh, comment on the question, which I think is a, a deep and poignant question, and I wouldn't want to, um, uh, I'd, I'd like to sort of broaden the question beyond hegemony and socialist strategy. I think that those of us on the left need to think very deeply and non-defensively about the ways in which the kinds of theorizations and the kinds of political practice that we have, have formed the center of our activities over the last 25 years may have, in fact, yes, dovetailed all too neatly with what you're calling a user-friendly neoliberal capitalism. Um, and I don't say this, I want to again be clear, to if, if, if blame you know, the book. Uh, I've made the same argument about the whole of second wave feminism, which again, I don't want to blame. But um, I think we really need a searching uh, you know, attempt to think about what did it mean. At the very least, it's a coincidence. At the very least, we reject, for very impeccably good reasons, traditional Marxism, and we become fascinated by very um, profound and intellectually serious alternative models that are premised around discourse. We basically forget about the critique of political economy and uh, about the project of critical social theory more broadly. We essentially preoccupy ourselves with cultural critique, uh, theories of articulation, and so on. And at the very least, it's a coincidence that we do all this at exactly the moment, as Chantal uh, explains, in which the social democratic background, which maybe all of this was intended to radicalize, is being dismantled before our face and being replaced by this other thing. Is it 
merely a coincidence? <laughs> That's a hard question, but it is at least a disturbing coincidence. I think everybody wants to intervene. <laughs> uh, let's see, I think Sheila had the next one, and then Robin, and I think then Ernesto uh, wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which uh, microphone? Can we use this? Um, I want to make a point about <laughs> social ontology and one about democracy, because I'm really trying to understand something. And this is between, it seems, between me and Ernesto. You know, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce distinguishes between firstness, secondness, and thirdness. It's an important distinction, and I think one that you are familiar with. The firstness is, you know, my toothache. That around which all of, you know, empiricist epistemology is based, namely the firstness becomes a moment of referent for truth. And we all have rejected that in varieties of tradition and so on. Thirdness is the mediation, of course, you know, concept and meaning. But what Peirce insists on, and what I think Nancy is getting at, what I'm uh, trying to say to you by saying social ontology is not a critique of society, is this notion of secondness. And indeed, secondness. Uh, and indeed, the best, the best articulation of this is that famous statement from the 18th premier, men make their own history, but not under conditions chosen by themselves, you know, but under conditions. We, we know all this. The issue is how can we re-articulate this? I think you may be trying to do this via the notion of the structuration of the totality. And somehow in this third chapter, I'm getting lost because I know, you know, you came out of a critique of Althusser as well, but there really is this point that to have a theory of society that doesn't just dissolve in discursive idealism, we are going to have to have some notion of the relationship of structure and action, some notion of the relationship of patterns that are not chosen, that are inherited, some notion of the secondness of the you know, of the economy. And I don't think we disagree here, but there is, it didn't become clear to me until I heard you again that, you know, what the problem was. Maybe these comments help. Now, the second question about the, the term uh, democracy, I'm not going to get into strategy. Uh, that's not my forte, but look, this is a concept that is almost, you know, coeval with Western philosophical thinking. We can't simply say we are going to define it in this way. You defined it in terms of the inclusion of the excluded. Wonderful. But this is also a liberal project. So how are we distinguishing here? And this is not a minimal, this is not a minimal distinction because you are w wanting to say, well, there are mass democracies, there are illiberal democracies, but for us, it cannot be identified with any set of institutions. No, it is very important to be able to be clear about the set of institutions that we on the left consider the conditio sine qua non, the minimum condition for calling something any kind of a project of democracy, and here I do want to say something about, Drusilla said something incredibly important, and particularly at this moment in this country, maybe this gets into strategy. Every democracy also has its own political imagination, its own constitutional principles and public vocabulary. Right now, you know, the only thing that seems to be moving in this country is a Tea Party movement, where you have 60-year-old retirees running around with the Constitution of the United States, saying, where is my country? We on the left are completely baffled and stimmed by what's happened to the Obama administration and to the Democratic project. We are at the moment speechless. And if we are going to recover our speech, I think I completely agree with you know, Drusilla. It is going to be on the foundation, on the basis of already established public vocabularies, political imaginary, and you know, get back the constitutional traditions to the people. How else are we going to do it? Yeah. Uh, it, it comes in the flow of uh, what Nancy and Shayla have said. Uh, it, it goes like this, that um, I do think in 1985 what appeared to be quite a demanding philosophical text actually had a grasp on the empirical reality of the capitalism of the 1970s and, and early 80s. I don't... The project, does it still have that grasp? If you don't talk about actually existing capitalism, if you don't talk about Wall Street and the bailout, if you don't talk about the planet of slums, which the Wall Street uh, is also connected to, then you're, if you don't talk about it, then it seems you're not challenging it, and the project, 
I, I don't see how the socialist project can not talk about those things. Indeed, even place them rather at the center, not in the old Marxist way of saying there's an inevitable breakdown or there's an inevitable solution of some sort. But, uh, I mean, even Hart and Negri, I think, should be given some credit. I think their, their, their proposed alternative of, uh, is, is an illusory one uh, of leaving everything to spontaneity. But actually, we do need networks of social funds that control the world economy. And I don't see anybody looking into how that might actually happen. And if you don't come up with an alternative, uh, if you're not focused on the at least need to look at the economy. And Ernesto and Chantal can't do this work all by themselves, but they could find something in. It might be Arigi or Brenner or Wallerstein or, or maybe some bourgeois economist, you know, has actually lighted on a, a, a path uh, that would d lend a degree of governance to global capitalism. But if you don't speak about global capitalism and how it actually works, somehow uh, you are likely to be its victim. Uh, I, I want there to be more conversation with the public, but I can't say no to you, Drusilla. Let me be very, then, very then, brief. Which and is then Ernesto has the, uh, the floor also. <laughs> after uh, you, after you. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me just be very brief. I think we have to take into account just how bad things are in this country when the Supreme Court of the United States says that corporations have the right to unlimited spending on their candidates and unions, because they are persons, and unions have no ability whatsoever to contribute anything because unions have not been given the legal category of persons. To some degree, this does reinscribe class division in the crassest manner. Yes, I want to say very briefly uh, two things, one concerning uh, the economy, the other concerning the bond. Of course, that there cannot be a radical critique of capitalism and radical democratic project without passing through a critique of the political economy. That uh, is a point uh, uh, that is for me so obvious that uh, um, uh, although it is a point which uh, requires to be um, uh, reasserted from time to time, as uh, Nancy has done it in a, a quite uh, nice way. Uh, the point is, what is the critique of political economy? Certainly, the foundations of Martian economics were uh, deeply flawed. The, uh, the labor theory of value cannot be accepted. Robin has uh, re re reminded us of the book by Ian Steedman and the uh, Srafian critique of the um, theory, theory of value. And many of the categories of Martian economics require to be radical reform radically reformulated. If we are thinking in a left-wing critique of the political economy, two aspects, I think, are essentially essential. First aspect, we have to think in the relationship between the um, economic um, movements of society and the state institutions. Uh, secondly, what we have to think is what are the social agents uh, of an anti-capitalist project which are created as a result of the um, process of capitalist development. The Marxian uh, tradition thought that there was only one location which was the location of a radically anti-capitalist uh, struggle, which was the working class giving its position in the process of production. But uh, for reasons that I don't have time to explain here, I think this cannot be maintained. Capitalism is creating many other contradictions. It's creating social marginality. It's creating imbalances between the sections of the economy. It's creating ecological problems. And each one of these spheres um, uh, generate uh, possible historical actors, which are not simply cultural struggles, are very much struggles which take place around institution and uh, everything concerning um, uh, them. 
So, uh, from this point of view, I think uh, the task of a critique of uh, the politi uh, political economy is a very central, should be a central task of the left. But uh, that we have really a new beginning, not a new, a total beginning. Uh, you have mentioned Brennan and, and uh, some other authors who have made a very valuable contribution. The elements are there. The synthesis is still not entirely uh, there. And that, I think, is a, 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 a very important task ahead. The second concern, the question of democracy. My insistence in uh, that at the basic level of defining a, a, a democratic logic, one has to put away uh, a, a constitutional argument is the, simply the fact that if we could propose some kind of blueprint of an institutionally organized society, we do away with historical variety. What was radical democracy in China in the 1930s and early 40s? It was the long march of Mao, because there was no other